Um, who's kicking things off today? I think I am. So Damek on, or I'm not sure if he's joining or not. He said he was a little busy, but uh, are you volunteering, Shane? Or uh, well, I, well, I think David Schmoy is probably no mark best, but <laughs> time is passing. I think we should get started. Yeah, maybe I'll start. Yeah, I guess we figured David would have too many stories and Mark wouldn't get to talk. But um, <laughs> it is okay for everyone else who don't know what's going on. Um, it gives us great pleasure to sort of welcome Mark back to Ithaca. Mm -hmm. um, so Mark is right now the Fletcher Jones Foundation Professor of Mathematics and Statistics and the George Roberts Fellow at Claremont McKenna College. Um, before this, he was at Duke Mathematics and Statistical Sciences. Um, the part which we are most interested in is the part before that when he was a graduate student at Cornell Dory, um, working with David Schmeiss. Um, I found this really nice little bit in Mark's biography where he says that he became interested in the problems that he's famous for while at Cornell Ari. Um, and he says that David taught a graduate course in randomized algorithms, which got me started. And then I took a course with Percy Diaconis on Mark of Chain Theory and the rest is history. Uh, and just to explain a little bit about what the rest is history part is. So Mark at that point started working on a field which is called perfect simulation. Um, like with everything which has the word perfect in it, this is one of, at least in my opinion, one of the most beautiful sort of aspects in simulation. Um, it's something which I sort of really like. I'm right now surrounded by it in my background, this, for example. Uh, but while in graduate school, I think Mark ended up writing three single author papers, one stock, two soda. Uh, so in case there are graduate students on this, seminar and wondering what's expected of you that that'd be a precedent but but like these were truly like some really unique and original ideas in particular this idea of like thinking about the bounding chain and using this for like sampling like perfect colorings in a graph like some of these algorithms have have been or were the best algorithm for a really long time this one in particular was only improved earlier this year and this led to a best student paper at fox um but then since then, Mark has actually written a book on perfect simulation, which is something which I used heavily when I was teaching a course on some of these topics. Uh, but then he has sort of moved on to using these ideas in kind of other estimation tasks. And today he's going to tell us a bit about adaptive estimation using these, some of these ideas. So without further ado, over to Mark. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Sid. So today, yes, I'm going to tell you about adaptive estimation for Monte Carlo data. And generally speaking, what I'm interested in is developing randomized approximation estimates for Monte Carlo simulation that are competitive with the heuristics that people actually use in practice, uh, such as the central limit theorem. Uh, if you read a typical statistics paper, you'll almost always see a simulation followed by the sample mean, the sample standard deviation, and then that's usually it. And I'm interested in building things that are a little bit more robust, a little bit more formal, that we can actually uh, specify what the error is going to be. So when people ask me what I do, if I'm being snarky, I say I use computers to make numbers, uh, zeros and ones. And of course, I typically have those zeros and ones coming from specific distributions. If you haven't seen the basic Monte Carlo method before, uh, here's just a review, uh, if you have. First, we're going to create a random variable x that has a particular mean. And using the mean makes things easier to build the random variable. We're going to sample typically a fixed number of IID draws from x, either using uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo or some sort of perfect simulation method or some combination of the two. And then we're going to use the draws to estimate the mean of this random variable. So that's basic, that's the basic Monte Carlo method. And that's what the vast majority of people do when they're analyzing Monte Carlo data. 
But the nice thing about Monte Carlo data that's different from say data from a in the field experiment is that it's very easy to obtain extra samples if you need to. So in other words, rather than getting a fixed number of data, why not draw a random num amount of data? So it, the big difference between adaptive Monte Carlo and the basic Monte Carlo is I'm gonna be sampling a random, whoops, getting ahead of myself. I'm gonna sample a random amount of data. And so T is basically going to be a stopping time with respect to the draws that I've already made. Now, of course, this is not a new idea. It's been around in statistics since at least the forties uh, where it's sequential sampling. But it turns out that we can do some things that are really quite a bit more powerful than we can do when we just smooth over a random variable number of draws, okay? So what I'm gonna tell you about today is uh, four different algorithms. The first algorithm is when your data is either zero or one, when your Monte Carlo algorithm is producing Bernoulli data. And uh, that we're gonna call GBOS for the uh, Gamma Bernoulli approximation scheme. I'm also gonna tell you about how to handle things when your data is bounded. And uh, that one I'm just gonna call HJ. Uh, when your data is reducible, I'm going to use an algorithm called TPA. Of course, later on, I'll tell you what all these things stand for. Uh, and finally, if you know a bound on the relative variance, of your output, then we're gonna use this algorithm that I'm calling PCLF. So those are the four problems that I'm gonna talk about. If your data is Bernoulli, if your data is bounded, if your data has a known bound on the relative variance, or if you're working with a state space which is reducible. So before that, I just wanna get the preliminaries underway, uh, looking at the faces and, and names on this call. I know a lot of you have seen this uh, so many times before. Here's one more time, just for fun. Uh, we're gonna say that uh, A is an epsilon delta randomized approximation scheme if the probability that the relative error in your estimate here, little a is the true answer, is bigger than epsilon is at most delta. And that's gonna be the goal for everything that I do. Now, what you may not know or may have sort of internalized without realizing it is that if I have some outcome of a Monte Carlo simulation with mean mu and, oops, uh, standard deviation, ignore that too there, <laughs> standard deviation sigma, so the variance is sigma squared, then it turns out that you need order sigma squared over mu squared samples in order to get one of these epsilon delta RASs. And that's whether you're using the central limit theorem or using uh, uh, Chernoff bounds or whatever sort of analysis you're doing, you're gonna need that. And so we're gonna give that a name. We're gonna call it the relative variance. It's also of course the square of the coefficient of variation for your output. More specifically, your number of samples needed is gonna be some constant times this relative variance. And then we have our Monte Carlo standard things, uh, epsilon to the minus two, natural log of one over delta. So that's gonna be our goal in all of this, essentially making C as small as possible so that it's competitive with the central limit theorem. For the central limit theorem, uh, C equals two. Uh, it's the same two in the denominator of the normal distribution. Okay, so now on to the actual algorithms. Uh, what am I gonna do for you? So the first thing that I wanna do is what happens when we have Bernoulli output. In other words, I'm trying to determine the probability of heads on a coin flip. And again, just to uh, cover all the basics, uh, hopefully everybody has encountered Bernoulli's in their lives before, but I'm gonna think of it as outputting uh, one with probability P, zero with probability one minus P, and that gives us a mean and variance of P and P times one minus P, okay? 
so far. We're still in undergraduate mode. And an example application of this, well, I, I, I worked on uh, estimating number of proper colorings while I was uh, at Cornell. So a simple way to estimate the number of proper colorings of a graph with n nodes with k colors is to draw uniformly from all colorings, proper and improper. And if x is a proper coloring, return one, otherwise return zero then little p is the probability of returning one, and your number of proper colorings is just gonna be p times k to the n. So of course, this is why um, you're interested in relative error, because we're multiplying it times some huge number. And so because we're doing multiplication, we want the relative error, so we end up with the relative error in our estimation. Now, of course, for most real problems, this is a terrible way to estimate the number of proper colorings because P is gonna be very, very small. And one of the algorithms I'll talk about later is intended to address that problem. But for now, let's just assume that we do have a large number of proper colorings. And so this is something that might work out. Well, if I look at the expectation and I look at the variance, and then I look at the variance divided by the square of the expectation, that tells me that my relative variance is one minus P over P. And so I'm gonna need roughly P samples in order to estimate uh, P to a close uh, relative error. And Dagum Karp, Luby and Ross noticed back in 1999, that was the uh, conference version. There's a journal version then in 2000, noted that if you counted the number of flips of the coin until you see your first head, you have a geometric random variable. And that on average is gonna require this one over P samples that you're looking for. So use your Bernoulli's in order to create geometric random variables and you're good to go. Uh, more specifically, this is just the picture. If I have a Bernoulli process, I'm counting a geometric as the number of flips you need to take until you get your first head. And the relative variance of a geometric is bounded above by one. If P is small, it's gonna be very close to one. And then you can just use these geometric random variables. Okay, well, this gives you the DKLR algorithm. I'm calling it that because in their paper, they just called it approximation algorithm. So uh, I wanted to give it a little more specific a name. And basically you're drawing these IID Bernoulli random variables until you see at least R ones appear. Let's call the number of trials that we need in order to get those ones M. And then we're just gonna return the number of ones I asked for divided by the number of trials that we get. And this output is the estimate P. The problem with this algorithm is that in order to understand how accurate it is, you have to get bounds on the negative binomial distribution. And you can do that. You can use Sterling's inequality followed by geometric approaches, or you can use Chernoff bounds. There are multiple ways to do that, but none of them are particularly tight. So what am I gonna do? Well, I'm going, what I happened to notice was that if instead of just putting these on uh, the, the discrete times, one, two, three, like a Bernoulli process, let's turn it into a Poisson process. And I'm gonna do that simply by putting an exponential amount of time, exponential with rate one, in between each of these flips of the coin. And if you do that, a well-known property of stochastic processes, um, at least hopefully well known to, uh, to OR folk, uh, is that uh, when you only select some of the points in a Poisson process, that thins the Poisson process. You take the original rate, which was one, and multiply it times the probability that you're accepting people. Classic example, if uh, people are arriving at rate uh, 20 per hour to a restaurant, and uh, half of them are going to order dessert, then the rate at which uh, people who order dessert are entering the restaurant is one half the rate at which people overall are entering the restaurant. So what that allows me to do is take those geometrics and smooth them out into exponential random variables, okay? Well, that gives me the gamma Bernoulli approximation scheme so I'm going to start off the same way by drawing IID flips of my coin until I get little r1s. 
call the number of trials that I needed M. Now, when I add um, M exponentials together, I get a gamma distribution or Erlang if you're feeling uh, your Danish pride, uh, but I'll call it gamma here. And it's gamma with parameters M, the number of exponentials we're adding together, and uh, the rate is one. And then my output is just going to be, well, I, R minus one instead of R here, divided by the time of that Rth uh, flip that I see. Why am I putting in R minus one? Well, it turns out it's for the same reason you put in R minus one in the, um, in the estimate in the sample variance. It's to make the estimate unbiased. So this way, the expected value of A is actually equal to P, the thing that I'm looking for. But I get something much nicer from this distribution. The second fact that we need about exponentials and gammas is that they scale. When you take a gamma random variable and multiply it by a constant, then the rate gets divided by the same constant. So if I'm looking at my estimate A divided by my true answer P, A is R minus one over big R. I'm multiplying by P in the denominator. And so I'm taking R minus one divided by a gamma with parameters R and one. In other words, the P has completely disappeared. So this is an estimate for the probability P on, of heads on a coin where the relative error does not depend on P. This is not a Bayesian thing or, or a frequentist thing. This is just the P is gone from the result. And of course, um, if you take you know, your first course in mathematical statistics, usually when you first are introduced to pivots, people will use exponential random variables for this reason, because you can find an exact pivot for exponentials that you cannot find for most other distributions. Normally, by the time you get to binomials, you're doing approximate pivots, uh, where we're using a normal distribution to approximate it. But because we've used our ability to draw a random number of draws, we have created a, an estimate where we exactly know the distribution of the relative error in that estimate. So, uh, oh, here I called it N, but it should have been R. Uh, think of that as an R that, that grew too long. Uh, so if I set R equal to 10, I get this nice broad gamma here. If R is 100, I get this nice uh, here. Actually, uh, these aren't gammas, these are inverse gammas because the gamma is in the denominator. But the idea is you can just set R to be exactly what you want in order to get the tightness. So. This is what I mean when I say this is actually somewhat stronger than an epsilon delta RAS. Not only can you bound your error using this method, you can find it exactly, precisely. If you want to have, you know, 1.25% chance of error, uh, more than 5%, you can set that exactly to that amount, which is pretty nice. Moreover, because it's a gamma, we can actually calculate the tails of the gamma exactly. So we don't have to use Chernoff bounds. We don't have to use any sort of approximation for bounding the tails. We can actually figure out exactly what's going on. Now, I should have mentioned this earlier, <laughs> but I didn't. Uh, if you have questions about anything that I'm doing at any time, uh, please do interrupt me. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to answer them as they go. If you prefer to uh, deliver them through the chat, uh, that's fine. Sid promised to, to monitor that for me. Uh, and of course, if you want to wait until the end, I'm happy to answer questions at the end as, as well. So Mark? Uh-huh. So a question. So to do this scheme, you, you need to generate an exponential? That's correct, but that's easy. But is this, what are the rules of the game then? In that, cause right, there'd be a subtlety here about what's under the hood of the simulator and what, what, what exactly are the rules that we're like, these are the only things you can do because then if I can 
exogenously do weird things on a probability space. Maybe I can cheat and just do one sample. I know the whole universe and, you know. Right, right. So, so the point is that these, ex whoops, going the wrong way. <laughs> the point is that these exponentials that I'm generating, or I can actually just skip to the sum and generate the, the gamma, is completely independent of my draws. So, so whatever I'm using to create my draws, then I generate this, this gamma, and then that just becomes part of my result. Now, the reason why I entitled this talk Adaptive um, Estimates for Monte Carlo Data is because if you're a statistician and you have some field data, you typically won't want to generate a random variable and just use that one random variable in your published work. Uh, because then if someone else tries to replicate your results, they're gonna generate their own random variable and get a different estimate from your work. But with Monte Carlo data, you can, before you look at the data, generate this random variable and output this result and forget about the original data then. So as long as you're not reporting the R, you're not gonna bias yourself into doing something wrong. Okay. Did that answer your question? In part, although I, I mean, guess- you there... can always do, do something extra, independent, but you don't want to do something, of course, that's gonna modify things too badly. So here I replaced uh, intervals of length one with intervals that are exponentially distributed with rate one. And of course, that loses me a little bit of, of um, accuracy, but not a whole lot because the relative variance of the geometrics was one minus P, the relative variance of the exponential is just one. So I've added intentionally a little bit of smoothing, a little bit of uh, spread into this in order to greatly gain the ability to analyze the error. And then the, the one other question I would ask is, could you maybe comment on a very high level about what is known as far as literal minimax things here that are literally minimax, where I know in the Bayesian setting, you know, that the, there's, there's maybe more known there. And I know there's been like Sam Hopkins and others had these recent works that even beg the question of, yeah, is, is the naive plugin thing really the right rigorous, you know, minimax thing to look here? So what is known about these basic questions for Bernoulli coins from literally min-max optimal estimator, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so what's known is that you're gonna need uh, something like uh, a constant divided by P times epsilon to the minus two natural log of one over delta if you have an epsilon delta approximation scheme. And that uh, was actually proven in this original paper uh, okay. by Dagum, Karp, Luby, and Ross. Yeah. Okay. The constant that they got wasn't very good. It was about 0 0.02. Um, the central limit theorem indicates that the best constant that you should be able to get is two, but that's not a proof. Uh, I haven't, uh, I don't know if, if anyone has developed a better lower bound on the constant. Okay. Mark, I'm sorry, Maybe one more quick comment. Oh, sorry, go ahead, sure. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, I guess one thing that I just wanted to highlight is that you're you're not solving, for example, rare event simulation because you still need those m samples no. at the start. No. And then what what you're what you're doing is you're saying, given given m, here is here is the the true error distribution for this particular estimator. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So the fact that for a lot of applications, p is small and this is gonna take a long time to run. I am not, con that is not the problem I'm solving here. The problem I'm solving is for those instances where P happens to be big uh, and big could be, you know, 0. 0.0001 on a modern computer. How can I be sure that I'm, I'm within the right relative accuracy? Yeah. 
because that's a problem that, of course, comes up a lot. Uh, people, you know, teach acceptance rejection for estimation, and then they move on to a much fancier algorithm. But when you look at the literature, a lot of what people are doing is just basic acceptance rejection. So why not do it um, do it uh, correctly is my, my thing. Now, of course, uh, for those of you who've ever looked at a gamma distribution, you know that it's not symmetric. It's skewed in one direction. So if you go ahead and tilt the estimate slightly. And by slightly, I mean divide it by one plus two thirds epsilon squared. This obviously came from a Taylor series expansion some at some point. Then the result that you get is actually slightly better than the central limit theorem. Now, here I'm saying the central limit theorem is a heuristic, but if it was actually an algorithm, this would still use fewer samples than it. And the reason for that is, of course, the normal tails go off to infinity, whereas regular binomial tails don't. And so what I found is, for instance, for epsilon 0.1, delta 1%, uh, the tilted or skewed GBOS will use 661 for R. Just a basic central limit theorem analysis would use 663. And that's just because the normal is slightly more spread out than in gamma. It's unbounded on, on one end instead of on, on two ends. So that's kind of nice. Uh, it obviously doesn't beat it by a lot, but uh, obviously the central limit theorem is what is most often used in practice in estimating these fees. And so it's nice that on average, we need fewer samples in order to make it work. Good question okay. following up. Yeah. Um, so following up what Dave asked, it, it seemed like so in your denominator, you had this gamma distribution right. with parameter R. If I just replace that with like the sort of inversion formula for the gamma, but take like mm -hmm. a regular grid of R points. So I'm trying to think of like, suppose I want to de-randomize this. Like, is, yeah, yeah. Like, is well, there any advantage the, to the having- to de-randomize it is to replace the exponentials back with ones, uh, in which case you have a negative binomial. And the problem with the negative binomial is that it just doesn't scale well when you divide by P. Uh, the, if you look at the tail probabilities, they're hard to compute. And this way, by doing this, this spread, uh, we have created something uh, which is possible to analyze. Now, uh, one thing that you could do is generate multiple times the exponentials. And each one of those then would be inverse gamma distributed. And so you could still say something about the tails. It would just be more complicated to compute because now I'm doing two of these gammas or three of these gammas as well. And that's actually something that I'm working on right now. So uh, yeah, uh, there is a way to slightly de-randomize things. Doing, it turns out doing two of these, you get most of the, the payback back. Uh, doing more than that doesn't, doesn't really seem to help. But you do feel sort of adding the randomness is fundamental in some way? Or? Adding the randomness is fundamental towards making the error calculation easy. And you're not losing much, but you're gaining such a benefit of the error calculation versus having to use rough upper bounds on the error calculation that you end up using less samples. Fewer samples. Okay, got it. Thanks. Okay. So another case that often comes up, especially if you're uh, reading the approximation algorithm literature uh, from theoretical computer science, is a if you have an output where you have some sort of proof on the some upper bound on the relative variance. And, th and then the question is exactly the same as before. Can you go ahead and get an epsilon delta, which matches what you see with the central limit theorem? Now, uh, the theory of robust estimation, lots of people um, send it back to Peter Huber, uh, no relation. <laughs> uh, for those who are curious, a hoob was about 100 acres of land in in. Uh, medieval Germany. So uh, it's like farmer or lander. Uh, none of the Hubers are related to each other. We just all own land, our ancestors at some point. Anyway, um, he, of course, created a loss function to interpolate between the sample mean and the sample median. Now, if you haven't seen that, uh, this goes under the name of M estimators. 
So if I think about an estimate M for the center of a distribution, I can think about measuring how wrong M is by looking at the distances to all of the points, or not even the distances, the sign distances. So distances to the left are gonna be negative, distances to the right are gonna be positive. And if I look for the place where all of those average out to zero, that's just going to be the classic sample average of the points. And that is sort of what we're after. We're after the mean of these random variables. So if I look at that sign distance, it just looks like this straight line right here. Well, what if instead I wanna use something robust like the median? Well, then I'm saying each point to the right of my estimate is gonna achieve a loss of one. Each point to the left is going to, I shouldn't say loss, is going to achieve a uh, sum, a term of negative one. And now I want these things to add up to zero which basically says that I want the same number to the right of my estimate as are to the left of my estimate. In other words, the sample median. So that distance looks like this. It stays at negative one until I hit it, in which case it's zero. And then if I'm bigger than it, I want a one. Well, what's the natural way to combine this function with the previous function? Make it negative one up until negative one, then make it uh, slope one, and then make it one. And that's the Huber loss function that Peter Huber created in the 1960s. The problem with that is that it turns out that's very difficult to analyze in an epsilon delta randomized approximation scheme context. So Catoni introduced a modification of the loss function. Now he still wasn't building epsilon delta uh, algorithms. He was doing it for a separate purpose, but he created this function where instead things go up logarithmically in one plus S plus S squared over two. Okay, so, so pretty close to a line near zero, but grows much more slowly later on. And, he did this in, in 2012. And the nice thing about that is that then when you apply Chernoff's bound on these averages, you end up with uh, tails that are very similar to what you see for the central limit theorem. Now, later on, uh, Catoni uh, with Gulini uh, modified this to make this a little easier where instead of a logarithm, they made it one over here, they made it negative one over here, and then they made it a cubic in the middle, s minus s cubed over six. But for some reasons unknown to me, they throw a lot of uh, irrational numbers into their algorithm. And if you've ever tried to prove efficiency of an algorithm that uses irrational numbers, it's a pain. It can be done, but don't use irrational numbers in your discrete algorithms if you don't have to. So uh, my first contribution was just to note that, you know, even though Chernoff bound still works for this cubic, you can do much better by just doing five, six, five, six, and S minus S cubed over six. So, okay, we still have a fraction that doesn't have a finite binary but it's a whole lot easier to determine what's going on with this. And then the other thing that I did was note that because we've created a cubic now in this middle, it turns out that we can use the cubic formula to solve for this zero point exactly, that there's a way to do that in linear time. So using this just slight modification of the original uh, Huber loss function gives you an epsilon delta RAS. So that's nice. Uh, here's just a comparison of what this loss function looks like versus the original natural log one. You can see that it's very close near the center. Okay. Another way to think about this is that uh, the weights are gonna be assigned distance from the center and data points that are far away from the center are treated like the sample median. So then the question you have to ask yourself is how far is far away? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna scale the x-axis by multiplying by a constant lambda here and instead of looking at the uh, 
the difference between the points and the estimate. We're going to look at this D3 function applied to the relative error between the points and the function. And that's nice because then whatever units you're using to measure your output go away, obviously necessary for, for relative error. And then the scale factor allows us to uh, squish or expand this function to get the right outliers. And what I was able to show was if your lambda is epsilon times one minus epsilon squared over your bound on the relative variance. So C squared here is the bound on, on my relative variance. Then when you just take this many samples, you end up with an epsilon delta. So that's kind of nice. Uh, unfortunately, it's not as good as the first result. Those gammas are pretty much getting the first order and second order and every order effect and actually beating the central limit theorem. This isn't going to beat the central limit theorem simply because it's kind of a first order. You're not getting that one over square root of the number of samples uh, that, the, that the normal distribution gives. But to first order, we're getting that two which is probably the best constant uh, that, you, that you can get. There's still a little bit of this fudge factor with this plus one that makes this less than ideal. So there's still work to be done in this area, but it, it does match uh, normals to first order. So, and a quick question. Yeah. Um, do you mind going back to the, the polynomial you gave? I'm wondering if, is this, in some sense, like the best cubic you could use in the side? Like, and can you determine what that best might look like? Right, right. So it's the best cubic from the sense of uh, when you do this kind of analysis, you need to have this be true. Exponential of S minus S cubed over six has to be greater than one plus S plus S squared over two. That being said, um, is there a better uh, or quartic maybe, probably not because it, so I can't prove that this is the best, but this is certainly the best that can be used with this particular approach. Sure. So Mark, uh -huh. another question. So I guess like, you know, since there's, there's, there's so much activity now around, uh, you know, convex optimization with noise. And since the mean is, I guess, just the, you know, the solution to a, a simple a quadratic. I'm wondering if, is there a literature kind of bridging this literature with a lot of these lower bounds and, and kind of algorithms and kind of modern kind of convex optimization with uncertainty? Yeah, yeah. So definitely uh, Katoni and his students have, have gone in that direction. Uh, they, were, they were interested in expanding this method to higher dimensions. Uh, they were also, I think, uh, more tuned into that literature than I am. So I think they went off in that direction. I was more interested then in actually proving that this was an epsilon delta RAS if you if you uh, use the right parameters. I guess as a follow up to that, actually, is like generally when I think of loss functions, and sometimes I teach them uh, from like a probabilistic point of view. You can kind of, you know, in some sense, you can think of L one as sort of a Laplace distribution. Um, I, I'm wondering what is the appropriate kind of distribution for your loss function? You know, that's a, that's a very good question. Now that you say it, it seems obvious, but I never bothered to work it out. Um, so one way to think about these, these D3s is they're the derivative of the loss function. So you could work out what the loss function is simply by uh, taking the integral of these things. And then you could see what kind of distribution uh, you, you gave. And I have a hunch it would be a very unnatural one uh, right. because this is highly tuned to make the Chernoff bound argument work rather than coming from the probabilistic model approach. Right. Mark, when you compare this to um, the, the, the immediate thing you would try, which is probably horrible, um, so Chebyshev, um, how much gain do you get? Um, so, 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 of course, the thing about Chebyshev is that your error is only going down inversely in your number of samples rather than exponentially. 
So uh, there's no way that you're going to match the tails of the CLT. You might match the baryocene bound on how close you are to the tails of the normal, but uh, even then, yeah. I, so, so of course, a lot of the the intermediate stuff with uh, mean of median type estimators use Chebyshev first with the bounded variance, uh, and I've actually done some work on that as well, um, trying to find out what the best uh, constant for uh, those median of mean uh, type things are. But uh, this beats them. This is the only way I know of to get down to that. Um, to that two constant in front. Right, so you're, you're making dramatic improvements over that because somehow you're cutting off tails. Exactly, exactly, yep. In, in exactly the right way. Uh, this of course is another finely tuned with respect to your epsilon, with respect to your bound on the upper variance to make it work. Okay, so what can we do with that? Well, in a lot of instances, we may not know uh, a bound on the relative variance, but we might have a bound on the random variable itself. This often happens, for instance, when you're using important sampling. So if I know that my random variable is in some bounded region, and usually I'm dealing with non-negative random variables, so I'm just going to say 0 to m. Of course, I can scale this to lie between 0 and 1 because I'm only interested in the relative error in my estimate. But it has an unknown distribution with a possible spike at 1. And it turns out that that possible spike at 1 is something that you really have to account for in your algorithm. Now. This problem was actually also tackled by DKLR. And the version of the algorithm there is that you just sum your 0, 1 draws until you're at least R. So now we're no longer dealing with output that is either 0 or 1. We're dealing with output that is at least 0 and at most 1. So we can get fractional output. But we still do the same thing. We just sum those draws until we hit R, and then we take R and divide by M. Okay. And that was actually the general algorithm that they, that they analyzed in the, in the journal version of the paper. And they ended up needing three different constants to understand the, the behavior of their algorithm. They needed the relative variance, which I'll call B1. They needed epsilon over mu. This is related to that spike at the end, which I'll call B2. And then they needed sort of uh, uh, something of the order of our standard Monte Carlo error, which I'll call B3. Now, they didn't actually uh, add up the cost of their algorithm because they were just interested in improving the order. But when I added up some of the, the things in their algorithm, I ended up proving that the minimum amount of time that they took was B3 times 4 times the e, constant E minus 2 uh, times 2B1 plus the maximum of B1 and B2. And of course, that couldn't possibly be the best thing that you could do. Uh, this, by the way, is about 2.8 by itself. Multiply it by an extra 2, and you're, you're also... Um, also off. So, th so this they knew wasn't the right constant, but you know they were just interested in in proof of concept. They also, as I mentioned earlier, did give a lower bound. They said this problem requires some constant times the maximum of b1 and b2 times b3 if you're going to have an epsilon delta res. Okay, so <laughs> now my terrible slide. Uh, so. This is my algorithm. <laughs> Beautiful, isn't it? Uh, it's not as bad as it looks, though, because if you look at the key quantities here, we have uh, B3 and we have B2 times something that as epsilon gets small is going to 1 plus B1. And if B2 is small, this part goes away. So, so I need to have a B3, and I'd like to have the maximum of B1 and B2. Instead, I get something like B3, B2 plus B1. So not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but at least the constant out in front of all of this is actually 1, which is very nice, because I'm adding these compared to the maximum, it's actually two, which 
matches what you would expect from a central limit theorem uh, approximation. So I, I would conjecture that you can't do any better than this asymptotically. Can you do better than this nastiness in reality? Uh, hopefully the answer to that is, is yes. Okay, so, so how does this work? Well, one of the things that you can do, okay, so this is just basically what I said. Uh, you're, if B2 is very small, you're getting something very nice. You're getting something very close to, to what you would expect. It turns out if you have zero one random variables and you want to create a random variable whose mean is twice the variance of X, you just return one if an independently drawn uniform is at most the difference of two of these random variables squared. So that will return a Bernoulli whose mean is twice the variance of X. And so what we can do is we can use the GBOS algorithm that I talked about earlier to get an initial estimate that's, all, that's not very accurate, uh, has, a, of course, a delta over three chance of, of being true. And then what you do is you use that previous algorithm to draw a Poisson, which has mean A, where A is this variance thinned out by this number. How do you do that? We well, use the same sort of thing that you did in the GBOS algorithm that I talked about earlier. We can use uh, these draws, these um, Bernoulli's to thin out a Poisson process. And then you just look at how many points fall in a specified area to make it work. Then you use the algorithm that I just talked about, these piecewise cubic loss functions to estimate mu with a bound on the variance of C squared based on the previous things that you just did. And when you uh, do the analysis, put it all together, that's when you end up with that complicated expression. Now, of course, we tried it out on, on real problems. Well, toy problems, <laughs> I'll be honest. We randomly generated some ST networks uh, using a couple different standard models for how you generate ST networks. And we looked at the network reliability um, with 100 nodes. And what we found, that paper had just used vanilla DKLR, and we were from four to 35 times as fast. So it was, it was really a, a big improvement over that paper. So the last algorithm that I want to tell you about is involves reducibility. And it gets back to that question that, that was in the back of several people's minds, I could tell. Uh, in the first section, I had P, but P is tiny. So what do we do about that? What do we do when we want the size of A, but A is tiny compared to some set B? This is my representation of A being exponentially small uh, against the, the region B. Well, here's what we do. Suppose that we have some beta parameter that indexes regions that vary from B down to A. So of course, uh, the easing model does this for cuts, uh, for min cut, which nobody really needs, but the POTS model does it for proper colorings, uh, which, is, which is much harder. Okay. And my region volume has to be continuous in beta. That's all I ask. Well, Jerem Valiant and Vazirani in their, their classic uh, paper in 1996 showed a way of bridging from B down to A. And it's such a great idea that it's been reinvented several times uh, in the statistics community and the physics community. And the idea is to develop a cooling schedule, I'll use the, the physics uh, terminology, where we pick several different values of beta, maybe beta 1.2, 2.3, 3.5, and we form telescoping estimates. We look at the measure of the region indexed by beta naught divided by this larger region. We look at the ratio of the measure of that region to that, from that to that, from that to the entire thing, and we multiply it all together and almost everything cancels and we're left with the ratio of the small region to the big region, just as we were after. Analyzing the error in this is terrible. 
because each one of these tends to be a binomial. So we're looking at the tails of the products of k different binomials, which I've tried to analyze. It's not easy. Uh, so at the end, I broke down and tried to develop a better method for doing the reducibility. And again, the key word in this talk is adaptive. So here's what I'm gonna do. Inside the larger beta region, I'm going to draw uniformly from that region. And maybe I get this point here. Well, there's gonna be some value beta prime, which is the infimum of the, of the values that index regions which contain this point. And here's the cool fact. If you look at the ratio of this region to the larger region, it's a uniform number from zero to one. And uh, those of you who've seen the proof that the inverse transform method works may not be so surprised by this, but it's, it's a nice generalization of that sort of argument to, uh, to larger uniform regions. Okay, so if I do this again, if I take uniformly from this region, that's gonna get me a new beta. And then I'm gonna keep doing that until I fall into A. So at each time, at each step, the size of my region is getting multiplied by a uniform. Okay, so how does that work out? So the number of things that I'm doing, I'm looking at the, uh, so suppose that I ignore that last point. So I would say this had a result of two. So n equals two, it's the supremum of the number of times that when I start with the volume of B and each step I shave off a uniform amount of material, I'm still outside of the volume of A. Uh, I can rearrange this by inverting and multiplying. So this is the same as saying one over these uniforms is at most the volume of B divided by the volume of A. And then of course, products are hard, take the natural log. So this is the same as the supreme of T where the sum of the natural logs of one over these uniforms is at most the natural log of the volume of B over the volume of A. But as every simulator knows, the natural log of one over a uniform is a standard exponential. So I'm looking at the supremum of the number of points where when I add together the times for those points, it's at most natural log of the volume of B over the volume of A. And that brings us full circle back to our Poisson point processes. We know that the number of points that lie between zero and this natural log number is Poisson distributed with this value. So we've created a Monte Carlo algorithm where the output has a Poisson distribution with natural log, the volume of B divided by the volume of A. So what if I wanna get this uh, tighter? Then I just go ahead and repeat the process. Independent Poissons add together to give a Poisson. So if I repeat this K times, I'll end up with K natural log volume of B divided by volume of A. And of course this natural log is key. If this numerator, the volume of B is exponentially larger than the volume of A, you need that natural log in order to bring things back down to being polynomial again. Can I, ask I call a quick question on- Oh yeah, <laughs> sorry. sorry. Um, how how important is it that you get an exact sample? Like how important is it that ah, these are- yes, yes. So, so what if I couldn't sample uniformly from B? Uh, well, that just seems unreasonable. Use a perfect simulation algorithm. You should be able to do it. But in the real world, we don't have perfect simulation algorithms for every problem. So we have approximate ones. The, the difference is going to depend on how bad your approximation is. Um, but it's still, I would argue, the best way of using your approximate samples. If, even if your samples are approximate, uh, 
you should still go ahead and, and use this method because at least you're not adding extra error on top of the error that you're adding because you're using approximate rather than exact samples. Now, how bad will the, will the error be? Basically, instead of being uniform, you're gonna have some little extra you know, amount and you could go ahead and do the simulation to figure out how badly that changed it away from, from Poisson, if you had some idea of the, of the error away from uniformity. Yeah, see, it's, I guess the thing I was worried about was like this, this one over uniform reminds me of like the sort of flagellate martin kind of sketching ideas where like if you want to estimate the minimum and like that. Right, right. So it turns out it's not quite that bad because really what you're doing is when you're doing this multiple times is you're sort of starting at the beginning and then doing it again and again and again and overlaying it on top. And so you're kind of, you're not explicitly doing the natural log of one over the uniforms. That would be bad uh, from a numerical point of view. What you're doing is gathering just the number of points it takes to get from B down to A. And that, if your error is small, is only gonna you know, affect your, your points by the amount of error. Now, of course, it is then the natural log, so you're exponentiating that. So you do have to be a little bit careful, but, but fortunately it is actually not sensitive to, to being exactly uniform. I see, so if I got that right, like the, the one over uniform, it's not really involved in the estimate. The estimate just depends on the number That's of points. That's correct. Just the estimate of, just yeah. comes okay. from the number of points that you get before you reach A. So your yeah. estimate is like two or three or 17. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And so uh, I grew up in the 70s. And so I saw this commercial every single Saturday for, for years of my life. Uh, how many licks does it take to get to the center of the Tootsie Pop? And of course, the answer is the natural log of the ratio between the volume of the outer shell and the volume of the candy center, as long as each lick is removing a uniform amount of material. Uh, just like when I was a kid. Uh, but uh, we did actually, this paper made it into a blog post of the journal of irre irreproducible results, which we were very proud of uh, because we use the term Tootsie Pop in our, in our argument, but it really is description, descriptive. So uh, I'll just stop here saying these four algorithms are really right now the, the best in class uh, for this type of output. Uh, there's still, this one, the zero one, it's gonna to be tough to do much better at this point. There's not a lot of, of places to, to approve. Uh, TPA, you can do better by using important sampling with your cooling schedule, but you still wanna use TPA to find that cooling schedule. Uh, for the bounded, there's a lot of room for improvement there, and there's a lot of room still for, for improvement with, the, uh, with that, so. Uh, yeah, so I will uh, stop here and uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, since I was monitoring the chat, so uh, Mike Todd has a comment. Actually, Mike, do you want to just take the mic? Uh, sure. I was just intrigued when I saw that log of the ratio of the volumes because, and also when you talked about cutting the volume down by a fixed proportion. This was the precursor to the ellipsoid algorithm, which was the method of centers of gravity developed by Grunbaum, I think in the, in the US and Michigan and the Soviet Union, and turned out to be an optimal method in some framework for uh, minimizing a convex function. Yeah, I, I strongly suspect that my exposure to the ellipsoid algorithm uh, informed my using this sort of adaptive <laughs> <laughs> bringing things down method, yeah. So, um, you know, the word adaptive also rings a bell for me. So um, Bob Smith at the University of Michigan and others have analyzed pure adaptive search for solving convex optimization problems. Mm. And actually, sorry, not just convex, but any, any optimization problem. Um, non-linear non global minimization. And so they have a result which says something like 
uh, at each stage sample uniformly from the level sets of the level set of the function at the level at which you're currently visiting. Now, how you do that is magic, but it reminds me very much of your beta kind of shrinkage. And then the result is that the number of steps one needs to solve these problems, uh, I, I think is just linear in the dimension of the problem. Okay. So it's, it's, it's sort of ringing a bell with your um, approach for doing this kind of bounded relative variance case. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that definitely sounds like they're they're taking advantage of the same thing. That every time you do the sample, you're you're taking away, you know, uh, a fraction. Uh, I don't know if it's exactly uniform, like in this or not, but yeah, yeah. If you're taking away a fraction of the possibilities, you're gonna end up in a in a log of your your total possibilities, which is linear in the dimension. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. We have time to take more questions. Um, have you tried this bounded relative variance thing in any kind of um, rare event simulation problem where you can actually compute this thing? Yeah, yeah. So in some sense, unfortunately, uh, this this requires that you be able to sample yeah. from all of all of these these beta. So so I've done it in in things like uh, you know a toy uh, multimodal normal. Uh, mixture of normals, uh, and it, and it works very well. Um, I've done it in uh, the easing model and, and the POTS model, and it works very well. Uh, but I haven't uh, haven't really gone beyond that. So when you are applying it to these rare event problems, the, the key difficulty is figuring out this parameterization that somehow. Yeah, effect. yeah, yeah. So when you're doing it, for instance, for a posterior distribution, if you're trying to find the the evidence, then the easiest thing to do is just make beta the maximum of the density. So uh, you so you just cut off mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. yeah, and and that turns out to be, work especially well with multimodal ones uh, because as beta gets smaller, your problem is getting easier. Um, the multimodality is disappearing. Yeah. I guess one high level. So why did you call this a cooling schedule? Or yeah, yeah. So that that definitely comes from the. Uh, the whoops, I guess I didn't go to that one. Uh, it's a cooling schedule because. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, I've lost in the focus. sense, like, is this in the sense of like simulated annealing that this exactly, is exactly, yeah. So it comes from uh, these sort of physics ways of embedding these combinatorial structures. Um, so, so for the easing model, for example, uh, beta is known as the inverse temperature. Sure. And so, anytime you've got a bunch of betas, you implicitly, with the inverse, have a bunch of temperatures. And so, the idea is that this large region is uh, beta equals zero, infinite temperature. And then you're cooling to go to beta sub k minus one, cooling sure. to get to smaller and smaller values until eventually you reach the ground state of zero. So what you're saying is you're adaptively designing the cooling yeah, schedule based yeah. on the sample that you Instead get. of deciding the temperatures ahead of time, I'm sampling and that's going to tell me my next temperature. And then I sample and that gives me my next one. This particular picture is sort of starting to remind me of multi-level Monte Carlo, but it's a multiplicative version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I say, this is a really great idea that has been reinvented several times, as far as I can tell. Uh, yeah. Multi-level, uh, obviously, parallel tempering and, and uh, simulated uh, annealing all use things related to this as well. Um, I mean the. The physicists have been using this, well, since the easing model in the 30s. And so uh, they've been very familiar with this sort of thing. Um, I, I, I give credit to the Jerem Valley and the Basarani because they were the first to really, okay, write down, if you do this thing, you will end up with an epsilon delta and say explicitly what K had to be and what uh, reasonable things about these ratios had to be in order to make it work. 
other questions? I noticed Dave Goldberg left, so that <laughs> else we may have had way more. Um, if not yet, yeah, let's all thank Mark again. It's great to have you back, and yeah, that was a great talk. <laughs> great to be here. Thank you. All right, and I guess Damex not here, but like I think this is well the last of the official colloquia for the semester. So, um, yes, happy holidays to everyone. And <laughs> Happy winter solstice. <laughs> winter solstice. Okay. Thanks very much, Mike. Thanks for coming. <laughs>